Good evening and welcome to Enemy Within. This is Friday the 27th of November and we're on peoplesinternetradio.com where we are, as always, seeking solutions. And uh, tonight is um, should be a very positive start to the evening because, well, uh, sorry, start. Suzanne's already kicked the uh, evening off with uh, a little bit of... Um, a satirical look at American policing and uh, very enjoyable it was thanks Suzanne and uh, but tonight I've got a gentleman who's um, been on with us several times before and um, I believe he's got some good news to report tonight good evening Mickey Summers good evening Andy yeah well um, I've had to sit on this for 24 hours I, I knew last night uh, what the announcement from the Goddard Inquiry into National Historic Child Abuse was going, going to be today. The end result is that Nottingham is going to be better than a public inquiry. It's going to be one of the uh, leading case studies, uh, is my understanding. That means that regardless of all the perpetrators of the crimes, the criminals, the real criminals that have hit in it for so long, people like Ian Courier of Nottingham City Council, John Collins of Nottingham City Council, Alison Machowska of Nottingham City Council, Steve Edwards of the County Council, um, Anthony May of the County Council, and Alan Rose. They could put all their statements out that they're going to now uh, work with the Goddard Inquiry. Let's talk about what they've covered up and, uh, and what, what they've not put out. Because when I came into this... For the best part of a year, they were running, running with the previous story they'd run for over two years previous, that there was only three children's homes, a couple of abusers, and Risley Hall and Proof School. We smashed those lies. It's taken a, a lot of hard work, a lot of protests, and what we've done, we've gone from 42 survivors to approximately 300 now. The announcement that we got last week from the Crime Commissioner, Paddy Tipping, was there are there are over 400 perpetrators alone. At the moment, there's approximately 300 survivors. There's no smoke without fire, and they, they can deny that they ever knew anything, but uh, we, we have a, a collated history of uh, what's gone on o over the decades. Yeah. Now, initially when I came in, the inquiry centred from 1973 to 1989. Now, the significance for the City Council of that was that it was the time frame of when they handed the running of the social services over to the County Council. Now, the County Council ran everything till 1998, and this was Nottingham City Council trying to exclude themselves from any culpability in all of this. It's not worked. And I, I came in uh, to, to all of this two and a half years ago having been failed by Nottinghamshire Police uh, when I went to them in 2003. I also went to the City Council in 2003. They've destroyed all my records. Uh, there's, there's lots of stuff that they've done, but they're not very good at covering their trails because places where they claim that they've searched, that there is a paper trail. And what, we, what we've done, Man, Mandy Sleeman, uh, better known as, as Judge Mandy and... Uh, other things like Miss Marples, mm -hmm. she's great at her research. And we went to the very places that they claimed that they searched, the Nottinghamshire archives. And lo and behold, we find my rapist in there, in the job position that they denied he was ever in. Uh, we find places that I was sent to that they denied. But we exposed the bigger picture. And along the way, we've gone from 42 survivors when I came in, Right, to an excess of 300 now. How have we done it? We've done it by taking it to the streets and rallies, protests. And when we reached a point where rallies and protests um, were really, really not getting anywhere, we had to find a new level to take it to. So my idea was we form an action group. The idea was to try and uh, get a platform so that we could deal on a similar level on, on, the, on their ground rules, and what we did, we formed the Nottingham CSA Inquiry Action Group. We elected a chairman, a retired army colonel, and uh, that man, David Hollis, has took us to places that are way, way, way beyond my wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. But when we actually uh, were on the verge of getting a promised public inquiry, 
and we thought we were going in to discuss terms of reference on July the 1st. We got told what had already been leaked to us by an insider at the council that they'd already started an internal review. We were not uh, going to be uh, pushed away that easy. And David Hollis, he decided that if we can't get uh, get on, on a page with them, we'll go round them, we'll go o- over them, or we'll go through them. And that is exactly what we've done. We went direct to, uh, to Judge Goddard and we presented the case for Nottingham. And the way that we've done it uh, has led to us actually meeting with the Goddard team uh, about seven or eight, eight weeks ago, putting everything together on the table. There's a few things that need ironing out. Uh, and we will be meeting with them in due course. But Nottingham is going to be uh, one of the two places that's really, really high up on the agenda. It was named in the, in the announcement from Judge Goddard, along with Lambeth Council, uh, of two of great magnitude. Uh, from my understanding, uh, of the old uh, national numbers for uh, so-called historic child abuse, Nottingham currently holds about a fifth of all those survivors. So you, you can get, get a, a really big clear picture of the magnitude of it all. But... What Nottingham City Council and the Muppets that run, that run it, Muppets like Ian Currier, who once ran the uh, social services, they're going to have to explain themselves of what they knew, when they knew it, and what did they do. Well, I can tell you now what they did. They do did jack shit. Mm. But like everything else, sooner or later, the walls come tumbling down, and they're going to have to face their consequences. You know, Courier told me that uh, he would work tirelessly with me and he was going to do this, that and the other. At the end of the day, when I came back, all he did was hide. And I told him uh, at that council meeting in September the 8th, Ian Courier, you are a liar and I'll come all the way from New York to challenge you. Right? And I've challenged him all the way and I told him, I will bring it to Loxley House I will bring it to all your councillors at their councillors' meetings. I'll, I'll shut down your council meetings, and I will also bring it into your uh, ma- uh, uh, into your front door. I've done all all four of them, and he took he took uh, a personal dislike to me uh, when I took it to his front door, talking about uh, him wanting to, uh, to uh, tell these neighbours about all the paedophilia that he's hiding. Well, he tried it all. He tried, he tried an injunction to try and silence me. Uh, he's tried lots of dirty tricks, including denying me my rights to any anything legal that I'm entitled to. He ordered all the councillors to no longer engage with me. He denied me anything that I could have. But you know what? There's nothing more that he could do to me than what was done to me as a child. So I don't feel. I don't feel that the pain that I felt as a child when my childhood was stolen. Right. Well, they need to realise, as children, we were the hunted. Today, we're the hunters. And yeah. as hunters, we're coming back. And we're coming back to fight them. As far as uh, my personal stuff is concerned, I've laid the ghost of Beechwood, 1966, to rest. And mm-hmm. talking of ghosts, well, we're going to be the ghosts that come back to haunt them. Past, present, and future, as, as my good friend Alison just said. And I don't care what it takes. Right? Knock me down, I'll get back up. Knock me down again, and I'll still keep coming back. And if they were to try and silence me again by trying to have me jailed for contempt of court or something, I really don't care because I have great faith and belief that if they take me down, two more will step in my place and keep this going. We have such great momentum at the moment that nothing's going to stop us now. We fought hard and long for this, and mm. really truthfully, justice is coming. Absolutely. Uh, Marvellous news there, Mickey. I'm so glad to hear it. and um, uh, It's unfortunate that we don't have a video feed, but it's so nice to see that great big beaming smile on your face, mate. It's been... <laughs> It's been missing for, for far too long. I know you, you haven't been terribly well just lately and, uh, you've had a few problems in that department, but I and, uh, by the looks of it, all the members in the chat room really admire what you've done and, um, that there's just nothing but praise for you in there. And I know it, it's not just you. It's all those people around you, isn't it? 
Yeah, I, my name may be synonymous with Nottingham. I, mm-hmm. I may be the one that gets up and makes a lot of noise, but at the end of the day, it's a message that, that's clear and loud, like from those that stand behind me. Enough is enough, and we're, we're not taking it no more. And if, if they want a war, we'll give them a war. A war. Yeah. The only thing is, this is a war that they will not win. Absolutely. I, mean, I can see... Yeah, to, to those in the chat room, you know, you guys out there are the ones that's made this happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm just a cannonball. You're the ones that fi- fire, fire the uh, cannon shots. And yes, we, we've got a great team behind us here in Nottingham. And, and we don't take no shit from no one. But we're not going to take prisoners either because we, we have to feed prisoners if we take them. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll be screwed if I'm going to feed the likes of John Collins, Ian Courier, Alison Machowska and the scumbags at the county hall. Uh, but more so, that scumbag that's the chief constable of Nottinghamshire Police, Chris Eyre. Now, I've actually called for that man's dismissal by the Police and Crime Commissioner, and there's going to have to be an investigation uh, as I've called for that. Uh, uh, the Crime Commissioner, Paddy Tipping, he's under directions now that he has to notify Theresa May, uh, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, the Police Minister, and he also has to no- notify all, all the Nottingham MPs. Chris Eyre, I'm going to have your balls, mate, for what you did to me uh, in January this year when you said, good for you for coming back. He's just a, contempt- a contentious pig, you know, and I don't mean that in the sense that police are pigs. Yeah. Listen, no. he is the worst scumbag representing a police force that I- I've ever come across in my life. And he will see me soon, and I will hold that scumbag accountable. Yeah. He's, fa- he's failed in Nottingham with Operation Daybreak for five years not one person brought to trial what does that tell you yes there's one going to be in court on Monday to start a trial uh, that was originally linked to Operation Daybreak but now is uh, is borderline whether it belongs to Daybreak and the case of Andy Loggins that's been put back uh, because of prejudice to a trial because ITV filmed him going into court but they, they, they could try all the things that they want. Christopher Metcalf thought he, he was safe because of a uh, police news media blackout when he appeared in Mansfield. We found out. We attended the court. And where he wasn't on the court list, we, we exposed it and we forced them to put him into an open court. We're not having these paedophiles going through secret courts to hide who they are, to hide the councils and to hide the police's failures. We're coming at them and we're going to give it them. Don't stop. Brilliant, Mickey. Yeah, so... I I, I mean, for me, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, but you know what? I'm grateful I wake up every morning, right, to have another chance to have a pop at them. Uh But the one one thing I can say say is my conscience is clear. They don't have consciences. No. Something um, I think it's probably worth bringing up as well... um, uh, there is a fundraiser on the go um, to get you um, back home with your wife for, to spend Christmas with her. Um, I, I noticed uh, since we posted that up there, uh, when you did the last couple of shows, we posted it in the chat room. It has uh, come on in leaps and bounds, and we're now what two hundred and fifty quid short of the the final finish mark. Yeah, and that's all down to my, my friend Alison. Um, Alison Ellis from Nottingham. She's, uh, she's a fellow survivor mm. and her heart and soul goes, uh, stands behind, behind me and ev- everyone that's connected. And it doesn't matter. I, everyone who's played a part in the Nottingham campaign, right, mm. is an equal part of the jigsaw. Yeah. The Nottingham campaign is not about Mickey Summers. It's not about Melanie Shaw. Right, no. it's about a bunch of people that have had enough, right, of councils and police fa- failing uh, victims of childhood sexual abuse, and, uh, and Nottingham Police, they have a history of total failures. We yeah. even have a, a retired policeman, who I will not name on here. No, obviously not. He, uh, he, he, he actually told told us, and he's told uh, one of the uh, media people that we uh, actually work with. Mm-hmm. That they were told to uh, take statements from people and not to action them. 
what what kind of police force is Nottinghamshire Police? <laughs> you know, and he was a police officer from uh, the seventies through the eighties and nineties, and he had times when he had to uh, take children back to their parents, and he, he knew that they could be walking into uh, a very dodgy situation, but he would rather take them back there than take them back to Beechwood. That that tells a story of what the police do when they knew it and what they did. They did nothing. And yeah. now they're all going to be held to account. It, it's uh, really encouraging to, to hear those kind of results coming, uh, Mickey. I know there's one or two other people who've been having great results with actions they're taking against the police and uh, councils, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we... We've been supporting you ever since we got on People's Internet Radio and before then and uh, giving you a platform to speak from. And I hope that in some small way we've we've helped with that. Um, not in a small, small way, in a massive way. You know, it is about creating the awareness. You know, we've been very fortunate that uh, I've had a couple of uh, resources uh, in Mansfield where uh, a lot of uh, stuff that goes out in Nottinghamshire is covered by that one newspaper, the Mansfield Chad. Yeah. Nick Frame and Andy, Andy Johnson, two reporters from there, they've gone more than the extra mile to expose the realities of it all. They've gone much further than Nottingham Post, who've covered quite a lot. Um, the BBC are actually coming on board with us now, you know, f from their report on East Midlands today that's been splattered all over Facebook. Yeah. All they did was took the statement uh, that was live uh, from Nottinghamshire County Council's meeting that they invited us to, us to yesterday and and then took out uh, our actual comments. During that uh, meeting, uh, they uh, actually uh, had, had invited us, uh, all of us to that meeting. This followed an email that we sent to every councillor. And what I did, I put, it, I put the contents of the email on, on social media mm -hmm. and invited my, uh, my friends and, and followers to copy and paste that email and send it to all, all the uh, 66 Nottinghamshire County councillors. And I know of at least 91 people that actually did that. To you guys, you helped make history yesterday because yeah. without the bombardment of, of all those emails, they might not want to, 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 to actually speak about all of this. But it was first thing on the agenda and they knew, well... They guess they guess what was going to come today, and I, I can tell you now there'll be a few bombs twitching. Well, they could twitch all they want because at the end of the day, very very soon there'll be a lot of them starting to jump ship because those that have been a part of the cover up are going to be brought to account if everything runs true that's been promised from this inquiry. At the moment, as far as the inquiry goes, there's a lot of people who don't have any faith and belief in it. Well. As far as I'm concerned, my message is going to be loud and clear. And th th there might be a few people that disagree. It's okay to disagree, but at the end of the day, this country has never had a, an, an inquiry on the scale and magnitude of what this is. Mm. It's the only one that's actually on the table. Embrace it, try and work with it, and let's take these mothers down. Absolutely, Mickey. That's um, absolutely fantastic to hear all of that from you. Have you got anything coming up in the near future or are you now uh, ready to take it easy for a, a week or two? Um, I just want to try to tie a few loose ends up. You know, for, for me, um, a, lot, a lot of people know that I'm, I'm very much an open book. Um, I'm a recovering addict. That means that I, I can be addicted to anything. And th this has been more powerful than any, any drug that I've ever taken. And, and my addiction has really, really kicked in. Yeah. You know, I live this like 24 seven and I'm looking for my next fix on all of this. And now just the same as I did back in 2003 when I turned my stuff around, you know, I, I've got to put something on this. Like, um, I, I got clean through a 12 step program. So I, I know that, that stuff works, yeah. but it, it's, uh, it's having the courage to uh, step away from it because being like a drug, I enjoyed using drugs at one bit until the drugs didn't work. Yeah. And, and I've got this far and, you know, it, it's like, where the fuck do I go from here? You know, yeah. uh, can what, I make what a, can I do next? Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Bugger off to 
uh, Rochester, New York, and get addicted to that lovely Lorraine over there. Well, well, thank you very much. I, I'm going to have to cut this short with you, uh, Andy, because no, sorry, my battery, Mickey. my ba- battery uh, on my phone is critically low, and the last thing that I want to do is actually cut out on you. No but to problem, each and every Mickey. one of you out there, every one of you has played a part. Not just in Nottingham, but everywhere across this country. You know. And without you guys standing behind us, right, we would be nowhere near where we are today. But I'm going to wrap it up with a big thank you to the guy that started Nottingham off, Graham Holden from Burnley, and the guy that's took it to, to the level that it is, retired Army Colonel David Hollis, MBE. What a wonderful guy. And another little uh, thank you to Nigel O'Mara from uh, White Flowers and East Midlands Survivors because he's brought to the table uh, what we needed to learn from the National CSA Inquiry. Thank you very much, Mickey. It's great to hear your fabulous news. Always great to talk to you and look forward to speaking to you again very soon. And uh, to play out this section of the show, I've got a song that I've chosen and it's for you and all your supporters. Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to peoplesinternetradio.com, one of the major voices of truth in our world. Hi, and welcome back to Enemy Within on this Friday evening. And um, great to hear from Mickey again. And uh, we've got somebody who a few of you might have heard recently because he was on one of our Saturday shows, um, but uh, fresh from his latest round of interviews, um, he started doing quite a few lately, is Steve Johnson, <coughs> the man who sees the future. Good evening, Steve. Hello, Andy. You're all right, mate. I'm doing great. How are you, Steve? I'm good. That song was for everybody who's been violated in one form or another along their path. As I wrote in my book, for every broken man, there are at least two adults responsible for that from childhood hold on someone just knocked my door hold on yeah no problem see right well steve all right. the staff are on hand <laughs> don't have a conversation i'm on the radio bob yeah that's right. yeah sam mate. <laughs> it all happens here don't it yeah, uh, so y- you've um, been flying a high life on the other side of the pond on coast to yeah, coast. Yeah, I kind of landed in uh, the United States twice. That was funky. Um, over my birthday weekend as well, which was even more bizarre. But it's just another day in the life of Andrew, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, what can you do? That's right. You I... have to keep pursuing the truth, don't you? Of course. Especially yeah. when you know that you've got to do it. The best thing to do is to do it, because then, if you don't, you're fighting against that, as well as the reason to do it. So don't. Yeah, absolutely. F- fight for your truth. Fight for your justice. and Never stop. And that, that's certainly what we're about here at uh, People's Internet Radio. Um, so, <sighs> you, you've recently published a book on Amazon, Steve. Um, mm. And... It's an incredible book. I, uh, although I've read several chapters that you kind of sent me over to have a look at as you were uh, writing it, um, just the wealth of evidence in there is just uh, astounding. Well, yeah, I was, it's or astounding, gobsmacking, or... whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> but it's evidence. Well, I suppose I've been a bit more, a bit better prepared for it reading it than most people would because I've been kind of hearing from you regularly now since uh, January or February time when we first got in contact. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've got regular messages saying, oh, I've, they've seen this, saw that. Um, the, the one that sticks in my mind, well, there's several. Um, there's <laughs> the China one that, that was so strange. Uh, you asked me to guess what you'd had for your tea. So I said fish and chips and bang on. And then you told me after your tea you'd fell asleep and you'd had visions of the earth being angry, rumbling and grumbling, uh, ships flying through the air, uh, people dying and Mm. Chinese fishing boats. Was there anything else in that? I can't remember. 
But the next morning, when I switch my computer on, I find that there's a, a ferry overturned on the Yangtze River and was overturned by a mini tornado, a freak tornado, and 450 people died in their cabins. And the mm. first people on the scene, Chinese fishing boats. And, mm. But it's not a one-off incident. I mean, there's so many that have come to mind. Uh, Tina was bringing up the one while we, uh, we were talking about you coming on tonight, and she mentioned about the the dream you had of um, children being run over by you in your Range Rover. <laughs> Yeah. And then a day or two later, there's a guy drives a car into a crowd in a marketplace in Austria. And I was writing about marketplace as well. And around yeah. that time, marketplace linked with bomb and bag, and there was a bomb in a bag in a marketplace yeah. in England. And then um, a couple of days later on, um, then the kids day. got ploughed into, didn't they? Yeah, in Birmingham there, the two yeah. young Chinese girls. And and of course, you haven't mentioned um, the scenario with Summer when she went abroad and how that, you know, the day she flew out, a guy with my name witnessed the guy shooting the people on the beach. The day she flew back, a plane was blown out of the sky. Yeah. And I wrote, here we go, now we're home, what's this? And if you look at what happened two weeks later and the date that I supplied, what happened in Paris, there it all is again. And loads in between that you saw for yourself. And that's just from June. That's the scary thing. That yeah. one that you alluded to with the uh, the rumbling, grumbling earth, the Chinese ship picked it up, tossed it upside down, and everybody drowned who were asleep. They met the fishes asleep as I was asleep with fish in my belly. Once again, for everyone about me, it was like, oh, God, Steve, I'm like, oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. You know, that to me was over as quickly as I've heard the news about it. And it's like the next one, the next day. Mm-hmm. And you look, that was June the 1st, I believe. And I said at the time, June's going to go mad. So I wrote yeah. you in that poem, didn't I? June, July and August yield for travellers travelling home. Yeah. Absolutely. And they have. And I wrote of Muslims on the motorway and you saw that. And I wrote erratic driving getaway and you saw that with them being chased up the motorway the first time in France. I did see uh -huh. when the when it kicked off again in Paris the other week, there was more. And in the same poem I wrote, and London, Glasgow, vehicle drop or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was on about gas blasts and stuff, and there was a gas, uh, allegedly a gas blast thwarted for London with a person prompted to do it from Glasgow. And if you read that poem that I read out on your show months and months ago, that was the time somebody alluded in your chat he could have written that at any time. <laughs> He's there now. Ask him again. Yeah, that, was, that was the truth frequency chat the first time you came on, wasn't was it? it? Yeah. Yeah, that was also where you got asked for the lottery numbers as well. <laughs> mm, like I told you we would, yeah? Yeah, you did say, uh, if any dickhead asks for the lottery numbers, don't bother reading the question out, but uh, I think Tom got to the question before me, so you did get that one. What does confuse people that go on to the cliched, can you tell me about me, can you tell me about the lottery? Yes, I can tell you about you. And as far as the lottery is concerned, the guy that presents the, just the voiceover for the show has been involved with me for over a decade. So yeah. I can introduce you to the broadcaster of it. But you still want me to give you the numbers to make to win all the money, don't you? Because apparently money, well, your problems go away, don't they? Um, I would say probably not. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded a bit provocative, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know an awful lot of very rich people who've blown their heads off with shotguns. I know a very a lot of very awfully rich people who are lovely people as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know a lot of people who haven't got a pot to piss in who are absolutely lovely as well. But you see, I was listening to your man earlier. How brave is he, Mickey? Mm. Oh, he's amazing. And it made me think of a conversation I had just yesterday with my son. Mm -hmm. He's sixteen and. Uh, as I've told you before, the head of history has told, told us he's a genius and um, Rob is a legend already. He's 16 years old. Yeah. And of course with that, you get 16-year-old stuff going on about you with 16-year-old acquaintances, etc. Of course. And I said to him, along the path that you walk in life, Robbie, certainly right from childhood, you will, you will come across all kinds of people. Some of them, like what you do, what, what needs to be put into context? What type of adult hurts a child in any capacity? 
what are you dealing with there? You're dealing with scum, are you not? Yeah. I said, and in life you'll find that there are people that are nice that are pretending not to be, there are people that are not pretending that they are, and you, you, you sus. But as a child, you don't know how to sus. You're taught to sus. But if your sussers, the adults, are shitbags, what chance you got? But as you grow older, you can walk your path, and you begin to realise that. And what you do then, the people that have diverted from you, your life path with their evil, it's from them. So what you do in life, I said this to my son, mm -hmm. you put people out to graze. So you're on a path, and next to the path there's loads of grass, okay? And you put them out to graze, and, and hopefully they'll feed and learn and come back. Or you put them right out to graze if they've done horrible things to you. And you still walk to the light. You still walk to the shining light that is your life. Mm -hmm. And these people that you put out to graze, if they're still entering your dreams and their endemic evil actions are still all over you, you can put them as far out to graze if you imagine beyond the grass there's a cliff with a big drop. You can push them off the edge if you want, but you still walk your path to the light. Now, that's metaphorical. Obviously, if you push someone over a cliff, you'll get done for murder, and you're not going to be done for murder because it makes you one of them. Yeah. So they're pushed over the metaphorical cliff, and you carry on walking to the light. And if walking to that light means that you have to get justice not only for yourself but for everybody that could be affected by a similar situation to you, or you need that quest for truth to be there. And there's a, there's a solid foundation and reason for that. Do that. Try not to let the evil of the past blight your path at any time in your life. You head for the light all the time. Yeah, I think that's a, a good message for uh, everyone out there to, to try and uh, live their life in a that sort of a way. Um we did get a question for you earlier, and mm. it's, it's one from uh, Unique Lee, who will be on tonight at 11, uh, on the, in the dark side of the room. Oh, I'll see what he did there. <laughs> and <he's, laughs> he says, question for Steve, what is the yeah. most worrying precognition that he's seen but can't explain, or one that he believes hasn't happened yet, and hopefully one that never will? <laughs> 27 questions in one then yeah yeah That's cool. of course <laughs> you've got an hour and a half so can't, can't they always it. come yeah um as far as worrying is and i'll use that term loosely because i don't worry about anything i get stressed about what's about to happen uh -huh. but i don't worry about it no um i mean are, are there any that you've had and you think I, I know when it first started, it was all very strange. You mean, is there one pending? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Am I worried about it? No, I'm stressed, but I'm not worried about it. Mm -hmm. Now the question will be, well, what is it, Steve? Tell us. Well, I was going to ask that, but you beat me to it, mate. Indeed. <laughs> See, I've been telling the people for years, the most frightening jolt I ever had in my life happened at 1.52 p.m., the afternoon of the 9th of September, 2001. That plane flew straight through my brain, and then it was on telly. Mm -hmm. And the elements involved were everything that I'd been talking about. And the same could be said of 7-7, but by 7-7, this was all in time-stamped email. They mm -hmm. can be tracked, they can be traced, that's why I did it. Yeah. People's belief becomes irrelevant. So all these years later, and hundreds and hundreds of... Incidents, and there's a parapsychologist spouting ridiculous odds and chance factors, and there's all academics and all top media involved with me in Britain. An American asked me live the other night. Fortunately, I'd, I'd slept in, so I was like, what, what do I tell him? Now, I'd explained to him who's involved with me, and broadcasting restrictions will not allow this to be aired. And I'll say to people, if you don't believe that, ask them. I'll give you the names. Yeah. Ask them why I'm not the most famous man in the world because I keep telling you what's coming. And even after 15 years, they turn around and say, what's coming, Steve? Yeah. Imagine how frustrating that is. And how many people have died through this? Be over a million. Yeah. Victims of bombs and on trains and being in buildings where planes hit them or a humongous tsunami that drowns a quarter of a million people. Or and that's just off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Or you'll have an incident that went to America from me to their desk. The actual city where it was going to happen. And it happened the same day. 
the odds for that was was a fairly innocuous in terms of nobody was blown to pieces, but that particular event, that particular one, the odds for just that one were 139,680,000 to one chance of predicting it. And they had that in the United States hours before it happened on their desk. Was that the when you first contacted Pang Radio? Mm. Yeah. 2012, yeah. Yeah, that was um, quite an interesting... Now, before that, before I did Pang Radio in 2012, when I said a pungent smell will lead to a bomb alert in Orlando, Florida, at a school campus, and it did, exact headline. Mm-hmm. In the April before that, of, of 2012, and I, did, I saw the Pang in September, so about four, five months, whatever it was before, I did the show in Liverpool, Planet X Radio, and they asked me what I'd seen, and I'd had what seemed innocuous but was strong... A dream of, of being in a football stadium. And I've definitively said Poland. And I've definitively said, and this is like, but it looks like it's 1780s skinheads doing this weird marching thing. And they're this blatant, racist, Nazi, anti-Semitic chanting. I described the scene and where they were and what country I was in and the scenario. And I alluded it to World War Two because I could see two ghosts, if you want to call it that, of World War Two German soldiers behind these thugs, these right-wing animals. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Burns. Yeah, Nancy Burns here. And we're from Future. Sorry about that. So, so when I woke from that, I thought that was interesting. And I spoke about this live on Planet X. And if you watch then, that year was the Euros in Poland <laughs> and Ukraine. And they, sh- they did an undercover BBC documentary about how right wing it is. They even had black English players, their families like, we're not going. And this is 2012. And there on TV, you saw the exact scene that I spoke of live on the radio. Even the chanting about Jews and kill them and all these 70... They look like they were queuing up for a Bad Manners concert. It's 2012. Skinhead as it gets. So there it was on the TV. And I just spoke about that. And then I did Pang Radio and said, well, I've been told off about this, so I'll, I'll email it to you. And that happened to them as well in America. And that was three years ago. And how many incidents have you seen for yourself, Andy? I've lost count now. But it's been, what, a year, if that? No, it's... What, Is it longer? I don't know. Ten, ten, Whatever. Nine, ten months. And what did I say to you at the time? As I say to everybody that's in my book, then there's some top-end names in there. You'll recognise some of them. You said, uh, are you really sure you want to get involved with me? Because your life will go mad. And I said, my life's mad as it is, mate. Bring it on. And you were right. <laughs> but it was the warning. Yeah. I warned you. To, yeah. I promised you as well. I said, look, mate, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's a promise and a warning. And what I'm saying to you is how, how this ability, this life that I live, this gift, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, don't matter. Once you know about it and you know and you see for yourself, and your world's different forever. And you said, okay, okay cool, do it. So I did. Mm-hmm. That sounds quite, but that's, it is as blatant as that. I'm with you. Oh, I've just got uh, a little comment from Lee in the chat room. He says, the only reason I asked is because I had one vision where every aircraft in the sky, they look like commercial airliners because the tail sections were painted, all simultaneously fell from the sky as if they all just died midair. Thousands mm. of them. I watched them all fall. Not sure that will ever happen. And no, I don't worry about it it's burned into my head. That's why I asked the 27 in one question. That's cool. What you need to do when you get something like that, if you lead for a specific 500 aeroplanes dropping out of the sky at the same time, then you're going to perhaps be disappointed or overjoyed, however you look at it. If you look at the symbolic meaning of what that could be telling you, you look at like you look at it when you have a prophetic imprint that you feel it. If you feel it's a prophetic imprint, it is generally, and you take from that symbolically what it's telling you. And then if you get some more that link to that, it will lead you along the trail to what it is telling you. That's my experience. You see, there, I forget the man's name. Was it Lee or something? Lee, yeah, yeah. He, he's having it like one for instance. There, it's non-stop with me, literally non-stop. It's one long prophetic journey. It all amalgamates into another. Yeah. A lot of the big incidents that I'd call, for instance, that, that head back to 9-11. That was how many years ago? 14 years ago, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it is now. Gone. To the latest one that landed in Paris. You could quite easily see the link there back to 9-11, couldn't you? Could you not? Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so for me personally, it, it doesn't, doesn't stop. So, uh, I mean, this is something I've never ha- asked you before. I, I know I've probably got the answer myself, but I'd like to ask you the question on air. Brilliant. It must make family life very tough. How do you and your family between you cope with the the onslaught of dreams and visions that you have? Love, laughter, music, football. That's it. Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> that filled a whole 30 seconds nicely. <laughs> <laughs> you were expecting something long and profound, weren't you? No. no. Which is me. I'm long and profound. <laughs> Oh yeah, six foot two of you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice one, mate. Uh, Ken has just said he, he had a dream once that Newcastle United won a trophy. I know it won't happen, I'll move on. <laughs> well, they might do at some point. I doubt it though. Liverpool yeah. will. Yeah, well, they seem to win a few We'll win loads of them. Though. Yeah. Again. We've got another question from Lee. He's asking, does Steve have any other abilities, such as by location, or has <laughs> he ever seen through another person's eyes? <laughs> I don't know what the first bit meant, by location. I think it means being in two places at once, doesn't it? I don't know. When I'm asleep, my brain goes all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, that certainly leads me around the world, but... It depends. I mean, do, do I look into someone's eyes and see? Yeah, of course. I met a man once, told him his full name in one sentence. Never met him in my life, 200 miles away. He was a geezer and all. Yeah. I thought he were going to kill me, but his legs went to jelly. <laughs> yeah. That's... Yes. So, oh, sorry, I thought there was another question there in the chat room, but no. Uh, so... We've, we've fresh from the Paris attacks, uh, which kind of was what you've been talking about coming up. It was coming home, and it's certainly nearer to home than the other events of late. What do we need to be looking out for, Steve? Well, it's what unfolded there, isn't it? More than, you know, it wasn't a loose coming home, or that's quite near, or that'll, you know, mm-hmm. look at the information about what I was talking about with the football stadium and what unfolded there. Yeah. That's the fundamental issue there. Now, the poem ends with coming home, heading back here, yeah? Yeah. So what do you think it's telling you? Well, I think it's telling me that um, we we need to expect an incident on a similar or much larger scale than what happened in Paris recently in this country. Correct. Um, Something I've been expecting quite a long time myself anyway, but... um, I couldn't be at all specific about how it's going to happen, where it's going to happen or anything like that. I'll bet you now, right now, Mm -hmm. when it does, you'll read back a few, whatever, a few mails to the very latest one and you'll go, he's done it again. Mm -hmm. It does seem to happen on a fairly regular basis. So now a question that will come from your chat will be, well, why don't you stop this, Steve? Mm. How do you do that? Well, uh, you, you come you come up against the paradox there. If you stop an event in the future from happening, then it never happens, so you can't have possibly predicted it, can you? You can predict the course en route for this thing to manifest, but you can alter the manifestation if you're pre-warned. Right. So, so far, I haven't been able to because nobody ever stops it. No, I mean, just to clarify, you, you have actually tried... Warning yeah, oh yeah, the of authorities of what's coming yeah, down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you did. 2005, I was going ballistic, shouting from the rooftops, mid June's next. And Liverpool had just won the European Cup, so I weren't, you know, and I, so I was buzzing, and then it hit me, bang, oh god. There's males going all over the country. And they weren't going to Vera down a chip shop. They're going to parapsychologists, they're going to top BBC broadcaster. They're going to a guy that was schooled at Eton College. When the planes came down in 2014, the first one that apparently disappeared into the sea. The next one was shot out of the sky. Right. You see the information I wrote about that, and uh, uh, you will believe your eyes. Yeah. I had an email from Lorraine Worsley, MBE DL. I don't know how you cope with this, Steve. We're all in awe of you. 
I'll, I'll mail it back. Don't be an aura of me. Mm. This is how it is. Yeah. Well, it, it, the only one that I've actually met who's on your team is Steve Mira. Yeah. Uh, we met Steve probably four or five times now. Um, mm. Steve and Jackie, lovely couple. Um, Steve runs the Phenomena magazine. Um, and map it Manchester anomalous phenomena investigation team. I think it stands for. Well, and for me, the biggest thing was the SEP, <coughs> Scientific Establishment of Parapsychology, that he founded because he is, he is a trained parapsychologist who lectures and tutors this stuff. Yeah, where I was going with that, Steve, is that mm. Steve he will not accept anything on face value. No, you know, it, we were at um, a conference with him last October. And there was about 100 people stood outside watching this strange ball in the sky, in the bl clear blue sky, with planes flying past it, and it wasn't moving, so it clearly wasn't a balloon. Nobody knew what the hell it was, and Steve was very, eh, probably a balloon. If it's not a balloon, there's probably a rational explanation. He just didn't go down the UFO route at all. Yeah, that's Steve all over. So he he's been looking into you now for, what, 12, 13 years? <clears throat> can't do the maths, but it's 2004, I think, 2003-ish, so it's about 11, 12 years, something like that, yeah. Yeah, and he, he said to me, he said, I keep trying to prove how he does it, or, you know, what's behind it, but he said... Oh, he's baffled, he's completely yeah. baffled. I mean, I, I mean, he gave, for instance, because he does odds and stats and stuff, I told you about that Florida incident, 139 million, 680,000 to one. Yeah. When we did Planet X in Liverpool... Bear in mind, this was my first ever gig as well. It was going out live and it was a studio. It's proper, like, through airwaves as well as, you know, like, radio waves as well as internet. Uh -huh. And uh, at one point, Steve talks about, from the file that's electronically time-stamped, I hasten to add, provable, 100%. He took, I didn't know he'd done this, he took 28 consecutive pre hits, as he calls them. Yeah. And he says this himself. You, you look at the chance factors and they increase and increase and increase and increase. What were the chances of gaining this information? What are the chances of this information being correct? And, and so on. And you go through all that. It's all very academic. But it ain't when you look at it on a piece of paper. And anyway, the upshot was that he took 28 and he, and he took it consecutive and it, the odds came to 158 billion to one. And that's on 28 and he's got hundreds and hundreds. Now, if so, if he was to accumulate that amount of accuracy like that, when you when you realise that there's two, which scientists will tell you there's between one hundred and two two hundred billion stars in the universe. I'm only stating fact here, by the way. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, Steve even wanted to bring in a top mathematician. So look for yourself. My odds are more than there are stars in the sky of what I do, and that's a fact. That's quite frightening, I think. But it's a fact all the same. Yeah. I, you I, see, people say to me, well, there was, there was pro there's profits of past. Uh, right, I, I did that thing with the American show, the other night, the big one that goes right across the States. Oh, coast to coast. And, uh, yeah, I had some fun with them, but I was half asleep. <laughs> and the guy the next night, the mate at Pang, and is, is, same, like you, like radio show and stuff. Mike mm -hmm. Sam. And, um, his co-host is a former street cop, and I think he was an undercover cop as well. So anyway, at one point during the conversation, you know, that they go out for a break and whatever, and a bit of music kicks in, you sit and chill. Well, they come back on air, and Mike's reintroduced it after I've been speaking for an hour or so. But Mike knows me anyway. And he said, yeah, and he, matter of fact, he said, yeah, um, we've got Steve on the show, you got to call him a prophet. And his co-host went, yeah. And it was so matter of fact as if they were calling me a, you know, twat or something. And you think, hmm, that's a bit weird. But then you look up the meaning of the word. If you move away from the biblical connotation, if you look at prophets in terms of Nostradamus would be the most famous, the seer, yeah. you see the future. Well, yeah, that's me, yeah. Now, another thing I wanted to touch on, a lot of people say to me, um, like Nostradamus, etc., well, there's prophets past Steve and they reel these names off. And they've read a book about this and a book about that. What I try to explain to people is this, and again, this is fact. According to parapsychological circles and other academics I speak with, there's not actually any evidence. Writings are tampered with. 
dates are added, words are taken out, words are put in. Interpretation from original text can often be, and mostly is, completely different. You'll see stuff out there in Hollywood about what Nostradamus said about 9-11. If you look at what actually that actual doctrine does not allude to it at all. But it's showbiz. Now, where I've come along, Nostradamus didn't have 21st century ele- electronic timestamp, did he? I do. Yeah. And once I knew, once I was given the green light, I know that the original timestamp header of email, the computer it went from, the destination upon which it arrived, the route that it travelled to get there, I can prove to the second. Mm-hmm. So what people keep alluding to the past, the past doesn't matter. They didn't do this. This is evidence. <laughs> you get me? Yeah, I get you. Uh, we've got uh, another question come up in the chat room for you, Steve. Uh, mm. This is one I'm sure that many other people will be interested to know. And it's yeah. from Jason, who quite often does shows with us on Enemy Within. Thank you, Jason. He says, I like Jason, mate. He's sound. I like Jason's. Oh, this Jason is sound. It's a bit of a nutter, but he's, he's bang on. Um, <laughs> I Steve, like nutters and all. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'd love Jason. Man is a box of frogs. Sorry, Jason, but yeah. Uh, he says, can you ask Steve if he thinks that this info is being fed to him by someone or something? And if so, who or what? Excellent question, Jason. Um, it's coming from a source. That's clear. Mm-hmm. But it's a source that's so beyond any human being's comprehension. It ends there at that question. Because it is impossible to answer that. Do I believe it's a source of light and a source of good? Yes, I do. Would I therefore go on the God connotation? Well, you see, I leave the God connotation with the Bible, the Quran, etc. All of, you know, fine. Believe what you believe. Just believe it peacefully, yeah? Try adhering to that bit that your books tell you. For me, and again, I allude to this in my book, because I'm a very simple guy. All them stars up there that I've just alluded to there, 200 billion of them and growing, this vast, expansive universe, this bit of dust that we're all floating in through the middle of space called Earth. Scientists will tell you that came from nothing. It was an almighty explosion, hence the universe. Yeah. Right. Move along, nothing to see. I stop there. I say, what? How's that? How's that? How's that? Happen? All this come from, define nothing. How can something come from nothing? You define your own logic, Mr. Science Man. What, what are you on about? And I don't know what to say to me. Oh, that's too deep, Steve. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. It's a legitimate question. You know, vast nothingness, if there's a load of big gases and dusts and stuff, and there's a humongous, mighty explosion, where did that come from? And they can't answer me. No, it, it, to me, it's quite ridiculous. Um, exactly. And, and once you, once you think, hang on, yeah, and you feel the light coming, the cosmos coming through you, your life changes. And anyone can do this. I can't believe more don't. Yeah. I mean, as far as the Big Bang goes, I mean, I've, I don't know whether they've changed the name since I went to school, but it was called the Big Bang Theory. Well, these, well, this theory, uh, yeah, is the best theory they can come up with and all these people are academic. Come again. Yeah. Well, I don't it? believe them. Do you? I don't believe them. Bar of it. I mean, I, personally, I think um, they've got a lot more idea about, you know, the the history of the universe, the beginnings of the universe, whatever you want to call it. I'm, personally, yeah. I'm inclined to think it's possibly always been here. Well, you're also led away not to think about it as well, oddly. Not to think about it, not to. Yeah. Everybody is. That's why, you know, if you had, you saw just last week that show, I, I touched on this on Saturday, and I wrote on Facebook what was going to happen, oddly, before it was going to happen, but you didn't need to be a psychic to work that out. Yeah. The Channel 4 show that night was uh, My Psychic Life, I think it was called. Let me, have a, was, let me try my like psychic... carry-on show. Let me try my psychic powers, Steve. They got some mm-hmm. pretty flaky psychics on and ripped the piss out of them. Mm-hmm. But they've got one, this little woman, overweight, tattooed, walking around with a mum, and she was sitting outside Greg's on a bench talking to an invisible dead person, and then a couple of guys who were campers around the tents, over the top, you know, doing mediumship in Blackpool, and just silly little music and quirky little, tet the piss, tet the piss, tet the piss. 
Imagine what that's like for me sitting here watching that. Mm-hmm. These shows put out by these very big production companies who won't touch me with a barge pole. Why won't they? Do I sound crazy to you? Not particularly. Um, Jason's just said his wife's in the living room watching the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> well, there you go. Oh, yeah. I'll tell him if he switches his head in, he'll get big banged and all, just like you have. And I don't even need to speak to him for this to happen. Uh-huh. So you've been warned, Jason. There you but go. you're mad if you don't. Yeah, Lee, Lee's coming back again. He's got, uh, on the subject of the big bang, he said, artificial intelligence is possible here too. For me, always has been a grand intellect by any reasonable acceptance of what man can term as vastly intelligent. But intelligence, logic, reason, mathematics, number, all is number, so it's intelligence nonetheless. How's that to chew on, Steve and Andy? Ever I'll nail this for you. Ever considered an artificial intelligence is feeding you? God is right. not required for acceptance of plausibility. The use of artificial as a term mm-hmm. is interesting. Artificial suggests not real or pretend. This well, is very real and it ain't pretend. Perhaps not natural. Well, that's where your earth logic stops, yeah? Mm-hmm. That's what I call it, earth logic. You define, as you're bound to as a human being, you define everything in earth terms, earth logic, looking for a rational conclusion. There isn't one. And there's no logic to this. It defies logic. That's the answer. Right. So, hmm, on that, that turn then. On that Bob shout. Yeah, could it be a possibility that Steve Johnson, the man who sees the future, um, rather than getting fed this information a bit at a time, has actually been sent from elsewhere? Just you hear the term walk-ins all the time. People who are just sent here for this one lifetime to do a specific job. Have you thought about that possibility? <coughs> who me? Yeah. Yeah, of course. There's also the possibility: could there be some mega alien intelligence? Which again, yeah. Who knows? I don't give it that much thought anymore. It doesn't matter, does it? I don't matter where it's coming from. Don't matter. Mm-hmm. As I say in this book, that's why I keep my face out of it. It's not about me. It's about yeah. you. Mm-hmm. My work clearly reminds human beings of what human beings do. And a lot of that is inflict death upon other human beings. And the way human beings go about inflicting death upon others frightens me more than anything else. <laughs> George suggests sent from the local pub. <laughs> Yeah. I used to be, man, I used to spend a lot of time in the pubs at one time. I think a lot of us did at one time a day. Um, yes, uh, on the subject of artificial and real, artificial also denotes a creator that was. The creation of the creator also has power to create even things of its own making. We create clones and we are man. So we are creators now. Created beings that now create artificial life. Is this the first time that this has been done? In terms of somebody being alive and breathing and walking and talking, Mm -hmm. with live witnesses, and forget all the witnesses actually, look at the electronic timestamp words. And I've heard this from the top. They've never known it before. Yeah. Now that could bring into the question, well, why do you in particular, Steve? I said this to Stephen Mira once, years ago. And his answer said, why not you? Oh, no, okay. And that was a bit of a trippy conversation because that's a man who's science-trained, science-based. And it was just before, on the phone, and I'd sent mails alluding to this, London's next, haven't it, dear? Oh, what's this? Capital letters, London is next. All over me. And I was speaking to him on the phone. I said, I feel like a prophet. This is weird, Steve. This is too weird, man. London's doing me head in now. It's having it. And, and he's very matter of, because he's very matter of fact. He said, well, you can't discount anything. I said, whoa, 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 science, man. Don't go down that road. That's too much for my head, man. That's too much. You can't say that. He said, well, you can't. He said, as for London, you, you're probably right. You normally are. And bang, was I right? In fact, he said, you always are. 
in actual fact. Ask him. And that was ten years ago. Wow. So I had to learn how to live with this, and it ain't been easy, I'll tell you that. No. I'm bringing up kids in all this mayhem. I've got a wife and mm. a Range Rover that's bits are falling off of, but <laughs> a couple of dogs and a couple of cats and everybody in the world comes to me for advice. It's tiring. Mm-hmm. Well, talking of tiring and talking of your lovely family, um, mm. how's about we have time for a quick wee break, put the kettle on, whatever we need to do. Excellent idea, mate. And we'll play a song for one of your daughters. Oh, cool. Back in a minute. And welcome back to Enemy Within on this uh, marvellous Friday evening. And I just noticed on the schedule on the side of the chat room there how much the Friday schedule's filling up. We've got Mark Gillard's brunch on, uh, 10.30 to 12.30. Suzanne Posel, who was on for an hour before us. Then the Enemy Within, 7 till 9. And then we've got Martin Farrell coming in after us from 9 till 11. I know Martin's always got a great lineup. Okay. And then we've got Unique. Ah. Sorry? Oh, so we've got Unique Lee, uh, with the dark side of the room, 11 till 1 a.m. Then we've got PIR Tunes with Tony Hurst, uh, 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. with the Cockney Winker. And then Lost in Transmission with James at 2 till 4 a.m. So, uh, nice to see things filling up there. Um, Steve, have you got your cup of tea sorted? Hmm. I've got another one on order, mate. All right. <laughs> so, uh, I thought of something I was going to ask you there in the break. Um, yeah, uh, something we haven't really touched on um, mm. is the the effect that these events have on you. I know you said you don't worry about things, but I know from talking to you that, that these events can be really devastating to you when they happen and is that more so when it's um, a lot of children involved yeah if it is if, if the kids get it it mm. is me bad yeah but you see there you'll say there when the events have happened I'm like that before as well yeah as it dawns nearer I can be bent over double like I've been punched in the stomach and been winded you know when you have a kid and sort of bully whack you in the stomach oh yeah you get winded yeah can't breathe. Or a football wax in the stomach or... Yeah. Well, you know that feeling as a bloke when, you, when you've had one in the, in the gonads? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's making my eyes water thinking about it. Exactly. But I'm, I live in the future, so nobody... As, as I say in my book again, nobody sees, so nobody cares. And I can't expect them to. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows. I'm if not... I tell you something's going to happen in the future, you don't know till it's here, do you? But I do. And I feel what's coming, as well as I'm led to what it's going to be. Uh-huh. So living with that has been interesting, but I tested the source of where it was coming from, okay. and uh, it won eventually. That's... You tested the source? Hmm. So the obvious question is, how would you test that source? Taste it. <laughs> Bubble. <laughs> Yeah. I'll expand then, yeah? Yeah, I think, I think it might be an idea. How long we got? Um, half an hour. So I'm 30 years old, and the girls are like six and three or something, five and something like that, five and three. And my babby's like, mm-hmm. uh, a babby, my boy's a, a babby. And out of their dad's mouth is falling. Boeing Aircraft, New York, to buildings near the Manhattan Bridge, Islam, terror in the sky, and writing poetry about it, freaking out about it. So, of course, when you're saying that, you've got three little kids and you're 30 years old, people about you think, <laughs> you're going crazy. Yeah. But even then, I didn't give a fuck. Think what you like. And at 152, here it was. And at 152, everybody who may or may not have thought Steve's gone nuts went, Steve ain't nuts, is he? So you're 30 year old, you've been talking about aeroplanes hurting into buildings and there's an Islamic connotation, so, so we're led to believe. And there it was. So, so how does a man deal with that? I presume you, I hope you're going to tell us. Well, I'll, 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 I'll ask, ask you, what would you do? What would you have done at 30? 
in that situation? Uh, well, firstly, I've, I've never had children of my own, so um, that one. Yeah, but you're an intelligent man. You can you can pretend for a minute. You can imagine. Oh, I'll pretend for a minute. Um, I haven't got a Scooby Doo, mate. It, 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 it. Well, at the end of the day, life, right, is very simple. People complicate life because people are human beings, and human beings are, f- are funky, but a lot of them ain't. And we all live in this madness, don't we? As, as an adult, pretty much, especially living in the West, you it, you choose to do what you do, don't you? Yeah. In terms of you choose your friends, you choose who's not your friends, you choose who you sleep with, pretty much, who you don't, you choose who you talk to, you choose what you eat, you choose when you eat, you choose what you do. You can even choose to go and murder somebody and go to jail for it, or get away with it, or whatever. It comes down to the number two. You do or you do not. You deal or you don't deal. You fight or you cower. It's up or it's down. It's not or it's day. It's right or it's wrong. It's as simple as that. I, by the night of September 11th, was angry that it had happened and I'd been through hell with my face for over a month, four, five, six times a day in any given 24 hour, in a pillar, screaming at the top of my voice with... Cluster headaches, as they're known, which is also, in medical terms, the most acute level of pain known to mankind. Tell me about it. I get them. Right. So, and so you've got little kids who may or may not have heard that. I was aware that it's not a good thing for a child that young to hear their father screaming. They'd have no idea of what was coming out of my mouth. They were children. The grown-ups did, however. Mm. So that made me pretty angry when it was here. So I could have done one of two things at that point. I could have cowered and probably gone mad or whatever. Or I could roll my sleeves up and go, right, well, it clearly ain't going to stop. So best thing I can do is prove it. Then belief goes out the window. So I did that. That's my way of dealing with it. That sounds a pretty good way of dealing with it, yeah. Yeah. Probably uh, a better way than most people would have chosen. Um, well, it's said that, I mean, I've learned that Carl Sagan is his name, Sagan or something like that. Oh, yeah, Carl Sagan. The saying accredited to him is that extraordinary claims need extraordinary extraordinary evidence to back up those claims. Yeah. And we have it. Piles and piles and piles of it. Absolutely, mate, yeah. I mean, your book's now been out, um, what is it, about two weeks? November the 5th. Right. I needed to get it out before the 9th. Oh, so it's three weeks now. Yeah. yeah, so it's been out three weeks. Um, yeah. Have you had any interesting or remarkable reactions? Good question, yeah. I know there's one that really gets up your nose, but, I mean, you could talk about that one as well if you want. No, 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 no. It's just It's been good. To, people are stunned, which is can go one of two ways. Because when you're stunned by something, it's back to that choice again. You can shut your ear, you can stick your fingers in your ears and run away going, no... Mm-hmm. Or you can go, blimey, show us more. And again, I alluded in this, in this book at the end, you'll see it. I have decided to write a book. You decide whether or not you read it. That's exactly how it should be. Yeah. If it bombs on its ass, it was meant to. You see? Uh-huh. It's nothing to do with me. I'm just passing the information on. Well, there, there is a third possibility. Um, I, I kind of hope for you that that will happen. That if I find some incredible information, I don't usually run away from it, stick my fingers in my ears. Uh, sometimes I go looking for more from the same person, but if that's not available, mm. what I tend to do is share that information as as widely as I possibly can if I think it's valuable. So uh, hopefully if, if people uh, find the book as remarkable as hopefully they will, or they certainly ought to do, then hopefully they'll be spreading the word and... See, that book there is mayhem. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, it's the only word for it. The only... The first opening chapters, I don't know if it's 10 or 12 or whatever, I try to snappily let the reader know how this thing came about and wh- who you're dealing with, what you're dealing with, which is just a guy with kids and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then we go into an actual year of actual timestamp words that I can actually prove were written when the time in that book tells you that they were. 100% unequivocally 
prove that. Yeah. So then you go from February to, February to December 2012 and you won't believe your eyes. Your rational thinking brain will say to you, this cannot be. This has to be a wind up. These people cannot be involved with this. He cannot be this accurate with this precognitive information. And I said to both of those Americans at the weekend, and it was my birthday, so I was in a good mood. I said to both shows, now the evidence is here. So your choice is this, come and see it or shut up. And I even said to one, the biggest one, the FBI, the CIA, I'll leave the door on the latch for you. Come round. Or don't. If you don't, shut up. It might be construed as being fairly provocative, but I don't care. They're only people, aren't they? Yeah. Ah, right. We've got Lorraine just asking, is the book available on Amazon? And Yeah. Yeah, that's Lorraine, who, there's Mickey's wife, who was on earlier from... She's actually over in New York State. Uh, oh, so. cool. I've got some people in New York. I've found. So I will send the link to Lorraine. Excellent, oh, mate. No, I will if I can find it. <laughs> send her the one with the Pang radio on as well, man. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Do, do, do. Well, good lad. Excellent. So is there... there uh, yeah, Hi, everybody. We've got 25 minutes, well, 22 minutes left. Um, is there anything <laughs> you'd like to talk about, Steve? Me? Yeah, you. Um, no, I'll do another question if anybody's got one. I like answering questions. It makes my brain tick. Okay. I'm just looking back to see what we've got through. Don't worry if they ain't got none. You'll have to ask me one. You're the host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was a bit short notice, but hey, um, yeah, I mean, I, first I'd like to say a, a big thank you to stepping in tonight, as I thought I'd already got a guest booked, and when I looked to confirm it with him, he's actually booked for next Tuesday, so uh, it was just so a It was reminder. your fault then? So you so didn't have a guest booked, did you? I didn't have a guest booked, but you stepped in and <laughs> covered it for us, which I was uh, quite happy about. Oh, so I'm second best, am I? No, there wasn't anybody else, so how can you be second best? <laughs> Come on, think about it. You're supposed to be the smart one. Uh, so they say. I'm the belligerent one, aren't I? Uh, is that the polite term? Apparently so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, th there's quite a few stories out of the book. Um, I'd love you to just relate a few of them. Um <sighs> One that sticks in my head, particularly because um, around the time that you worked in a homeless hostel, I was mm. in a homeless hostel, and you know, it, it came close to being the end of my life. Um, quite a few of the smackheads in there were, go on, go on, give it a try, and I did try Yeah, it, of course they thought, do. They get more on board, and it's easier to get hold of, isn't it? And I thought, uh-uh, this is crap. And yeah, yeah. I didn't do it. And I met somebody wonderful in there and she saved my life. Um, but. Are you working on? Yeah. Hello, mate. Sanya. Sorry, sorry, bud. I'm you... on the radio at the minute, mate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sam, brother. You, you worked in a, a Christian <laughs> run hostel. Sorry. That was the father in law. He's about 643. He's lovely. <laughs> So I carry on. Yeah, the Christian hostel man. Yeah, that was funky. Yeah, that was part of testing the source. Mm hmm. Mm. But it wasn't. It was the year two thousand. So September eleven wasn't even a thought by me, let alone anybody else at that time. But I knew even by then that it far out, out, outweighed any rationale, any avenue of rational explanation had been exhaustively explored and yet my dead parents are still waking me up at 22 minutes past two in the morning and it was pissing me off but i was intrigued as well you know at night it's scary at 222 when you've just woke up and you've just you've been with your dead parents where you used to live like it's on like you're in it because you are and then you wake up and you're at home again and your kids are asleep and your missus is snoring and it's 222 looking at you that's scary but in during daylight you have freedom of thought and the safety of the sunshine, do you not? So I was thinking, okay, what's going on here? Right, well, I, I was saying to the source, you seem to think you could drop dead people in my head. 
let me know there's something going on, chase me with these numbers. I need more than this. I need to trust where you're coming from, pal. So it threw me into a homeless hostel run by the church. Mm-hmm. And the the manager was a born-again Christian. He's about the most bigoted person I've ever met, I think. Because I didn't know anything about religion at that time. Didn't have a clue. Didn't want to know, didn't care. So this Christian's telling vulnerable homeless men, some of them were on heroin. Some, the stories that they would tell you, and this weren't a smack rat spinning you anything. These are guys in floods of tears at my fucking feet. Yeah. And I'm thinking, no wonder you're on smack, mate. And I helped a couple get off it. In fact, one of them, I helped get off it for a while, but he went back and it killed him. Mm. Young Adam. It was one of my little homeless fledglings. But, but anyway, as it turned out, I thought, I'm not going to stay at this hostel for long. It's the year 2000. I'm being chased by the number 222 and dead weird dreams and dead people in them. So I knew that I wouldn't last the six months probationary period there, but I did the work that I could do while I was there. I housed a few. I got one, one I'm, one I'm really proud of and I'm not, he was proper into crack, man. Proper, proper crackhead. And he was the crazy with it. But there was something. And I got him off that and he's been really successful in media since, weirdly. Wow. But, um, yeah, anyway, so I'm there one day in the office and this crazy, obsessed with hell manager spouting his crap, scaring everyone with his rhetoric. Mm-hmm. And he'd gone out to lunch and I'm like, I've got to get out of here. This is doing my head in. And I happened to, the contract was there on my desk that if I sign it in six months, assuming they want me there, but I rocked the boat too much. But I had no intention of signing it, but I'm not good with maths, oddly, for all the figures that hit me. And the missus has to help me because I've got a weird way of looking at things sometimes. She shows me ways, what's right, what she adds things up for me and whatever. So I'm in the, in the, uh, hostel, um, uh, office, if you will. And I'm sitting there at my desk and I've got this contract and there's a big computer there, a, a big calculator in front of me. And I tap the numbers in, I tap the hours they were offering, which was 30 summit times while that were offering, which was what, whatever it was, uh, um, whatever it was. Cause I'll just stand over my money to the missus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I tapped in the hours times by what they were paying per hour and 222 two, two popped up on this. I went, what? There was a gap in a Christian hostel that are obsessed with hell and stuff. And there's this. So I phoned the missus up. Oh, Steph, I've done this right. She's going, what are you on about? So this, and she started laughing actually, because I said to her, I've tried to work out these figures. As soon as I said that, she started laughing. Even my kids were laughing at me when they were six, because I couldn't help them with their maths homework. But, so she did it. And she, bloody hell, Steve. There it is again. I went, <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of testing, okay, I need more, I need to see. And so I'm getting physical manifestation in my day. Coincidences in my day. Synchronicities, outrageous synchronicities that tally up with what I dream and then you get an event. Could be a thousand miles away, could be a hundred miles away, could be whatever. And it's so accurate, the information I give. And I still wasn't enough. Now I'm not going to spoil this. In, in 2012, you'll see, whoever reads my book, that I went to Coventry, which is near me, to pick up a new Chevrolet Orlando vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what chapter that's in, but you'd need to read to get, and you see what happened and how I concluded what I concluded from the day I got that car, which was September the 3rd, 2012. Yeah. You will not believe your eyes. Right. No matter who, you can be, the thing is, I've written this book in such a way, you wouldn't have to have super duper mega intelligence to understand every word of it. My boy, since he, I mean, oh, yes, they say he's a genius, but he knew the crack since he was nine year old. And yet this is baffling academics. And it is. It has. It is what it is. Again, everybody has that choice as to whether they read it or not. Mm-hmm. And if they do and say, nah, we need to investigate this, well, come on then. You're welcome. Yeah. We've got another question from Jason. And it's, it's, um, it's quite a long one. He says, mm. I have no doubt in my mind that people with this sort of information have been drawn to Andy. Does Steve feel the same? And can he put his finger on the reason? Has he got a good vibe about Andy? And then he said, I hope you're not too modest to ask. If you are, I'll ask this box of frogs next to me. (laughs) You can answer that one yourself, Andrew, can you not? Uh, well, you did tell me that a long time ago. 
you said that I'd been drawn to you, uh, the, the weird things that were happening in my life over a period of many years that I talked to you about, you said, well, that was you being drawn to me. Yeah, well, in the first instance, you approached me, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I just you, sent you a you, message on Facebook saying... I've, you'd seen Summit or heard Summit or Summit. I've seen the New Horizons talk that you did with <coughs> Steve Mirror. Oh, so you actually saw me. And I knew from, that Steve... The cold spouting, yeah. Yeah, I knew Steve's nature and knew that Steve wouldn't be backing you unless he was absolutely gobsmacked, flabbergasted. Now, normally, because I get asked quite a lot to do quite a lot of stuff like this, mm -hmm. and... Um, you're all right, mate. You can come downstairs. And, uh, yeah, take that with you while you're at it. Good lad. Um, not bad. So I was mad out here. There's people mm. wandering through all the time, man. It's mm. crazy. What was I talking about? Uh, when I approached you. Oh, yeah, sorry, my son distracted me. You don't uh, do many radio shows. Yeah, I'll, I'll get offered a lot. And it's purely through, and how can I politely put this? You know, I, I call them, uh, I broadcast from my shed.com and people just drivel, just talking fucking drivel. I can't be arsed mm -hmm. with them. I'm not being judgmental there. I just can't be arsed. And I've got this thing about me. I can know if you've all right, if, if, you know, without judging, I'll know. Bang. Yeah. Sound. Come here, you. Well, from memory, the exact reply that I got was, I don't do many radio shows because I don't like talking to dickheads, but I get a good vibe off you. And yeah. I thought, what the hell? I've only just sent you one message on Facebook asking you if you want to come on the radio. How the hell do you know anything about me? Um, that was obviously before I got to know you a bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. So yeah, it, it was to answer his question on a, on a stretched point. Mm -hmm. There are many people that have come into my life that I've had signs that they were meant to. Yeah. Well, that's funny, actually. Jason's flipped the question the other way around. He's saying that he feels that people with this kind of information are drawn to me. Well, you're a medium of to get the, the voice out there, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. And drawn to you individually because you have the light. Okay. You see? And to me, it dazzles my eyes, so it's easy to pick and choose. Yeah, that's, that's, hmm, I think that answers that quite well. Um, have we got any more questions? Ah, Lorraine says, um, did you, a lot of homeless people are veterans, how sad that is. And I guess the guy he's talking about doesn't know Gandhi's outlook. God has no religion. I've not actually heard that before, right? So thanks. He does, yeah. And he's right. Oh, we've got a question in capitals here from Lady <coughs> Lou. Will Steve go on tour with Frank Willis? Of course. Frank's my uncle, mate. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a tour would you see that being? A fun one. Oh, <laughs> well, obviously, if it's you and Frank involved, yeah, it's going to be... <laughs> It'd be mind-blowing for anybody who's there. And for those who uh, haven't heard And then about, me and Frank go down the pub. Of course. For those who haven't heard of Frank, he, he was on with Steve uh, a couple of Saturdays ago with us. Uh, Frank is a former mercenary turned chi master and healer. And he's just incredible. He blows my mind every time. He's so gifted, that guy. Mm -hmm. But man, is he funny. Oh, God, we have a scream, I tell you. Oh, yeah. Some of the things he comes out with, man, I'm laughing my head off. But he's so gifted. I love that guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty amazing. Unfortunately, Skype doesn't like him very much because we had a hell of a job getting him on the other week, didn't we? But Gentlemen's he... barbers don't like him either. <laughs> they'd, they'd all be out of business if they relied on Frank. Bloody hippies. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I've had mine cut now. I've told him, get your son a mod cut, get your son a Vespa, or a Lamy, eh, man, he'd be sad. <laughs> but I won't say that in the same room as him. No, I don't think that's ever going to happen, is it? <laughs> but you're listening to that, you're thinking, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking to see if there's a load of Facebook messages flashing up from him, but not yet, no. You'll probably get all the stick when you get off air. 
Yeah, as soon as he hears this, man, he'll be all over me taking the piss. Mm-hmm. I love it. Because that's another alluding to what, was it Lee or Jason? Some great questions, by the way. Um, I've got a lot of people around me keep me grounded. You know, I've got in my life from people who were homeless, who, who, who their lives improved, uh, you know, to with carpenters and builders and a few coppers and a, an undercover cop I know quite well and and uh, I know a few academics and it's like the man, my posh mate, it's like my dad as it goes, that's what I call him, he's so posh man, talk about chalk and cheese, you know, eating school and all that, Ed Boy and all that, professional filmmaker and I'm from the bottom man, if there's such a thing. So I've got right across the spectrum. You know, the, the Times, right? Mm-hmm. The broadsheet. Oh, yeah. Called, called Lorraine, Ger- Lorraine Worsley a PR guru. Oh, wow. And, you know, she, all them years, been broadcasting and she's hosted events for Prince Charles and she's done all this stuff. And yet, the things she says about me, they're in the book, you wouldn't believe your eyes. So the first thing you say, well, how is she saying that? Yeah. How is someone like that saying in capital letters, this man sees the future and, and proves it to us? But she is. It's crazy, really, isn't it, when you think about it? Well, how come people like that are mixing with someone like me? Yeah. Yeah. For the reason, the very reason that I'm on this show is because I told them what I told you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know this last track we're going to play out with, you won't want me to fade it, so uh, I'm going to have to say... <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me tonight, Steve. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to chat to you as always. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 2 p.m. with our True Frequency show, which will also be going out live on PIR. And we'll be joined by Lennon Honor, who was on with us a few weeks ago on PIR. And uh, that will be a fabulous chat. So... Um, I just need to tell you to stay tuned tonight for Martin Farrell with Let's Talk at 9 o'clock and then Unique Lee with Dark Side of the Room from 11 to 1 a.m. And then uh, Cockney Winker with PIR Tunes from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. And then 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. is Lost in Transmission with James Wright, I believe he is, a, a new guy who's just joined us, uh, another American host. Great to see some more of them joining in. <laughs> and thank you very much again, Steve, and uh, have a great weekend, mate, and we'll speak to you soon. Yeah, brilliant, mate. That, that, um, the chick and Mickey is his wife, did you say? Buy my book, man, that's blew me away. Yeah. That's my night, that has. Thank you, mate. And thank Sound, you, everyone mate. in the chat room. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night, all.